I'm going to talk about what Netflix did and um, basically yet another slice of cloud architectures, what it looks like when you basically build on top of Amazon's public cloud and build out a large-scale global service. And then I'll end up looking at all of the open source pieces that we've been putting out and some of the ones that we haven't actually put out yet, but some of the plans we have for things we're going to be releasing in the next few months so that you can then go and build your own uh, public-based cloud application or, or use these pieces for, for other subjects. So I'm going to talk about what did Netflix do, um, why it did it, and when it did it. Then look at the, the globally distributed cloud availability model, look at the open components, and then um, sort of talk a bit about how you assemble these things to build your own platform. So what Netflix did, we moved a whole lot of things to SaaS applications, our corporate IT, basically. Um, we moved some of our internal tools that we use for managing our, our systems, like PagerDuty, which is the call rotor and the uh, the escalation trees for who you call when something's broken. Uh, our developers are all on call for if you push code, if you, if you had code running production, then it's somebody in your group or yourself will take turns being in charge of, um, if it breaks at 3 a.m., you get the call. Um, and then app dynamic uses an application performance monitoring, and we use things like uh, the, we use large high level tools like Elastic MapReduce, which is Amazon's uh, Hadoop. We then built our own platform level customized deliberately to get make our developers as productive as possible. That's the number one thing we're aiming for here. And we started about three years ago. There wasn't much choice out there, and there wasn't anything that would extend to the scale that we were trying to build at, and we knew we were going to build at. And then we moved all our incremental capacity to infrastructure as a service. We, we have the same small data center that we had in 2008. Uh, we have approximately 10 times as much capacity in the cloud as we have in that little data center. Right. So we're something like 90% of our capacity is cloud-based, and the data center has less and less in it. It basically runs our US-based DVD business and some of our corporate IT. All the streaming application now runs in the cloud to the point that if you break our data center or turn off the connection to our data center, streaming still works. And you know, a lot of our outages over the last year have been the data center broke and took down some piece of cloud functionality. So we finally cut those links. So now we're just completely dependent on the, on the cloud, which we've actually found to be more of highly available than our data center. And I'll talk a bit about how we arranged to do that. So why do we use cloud? Well, there's all these things that we didn't want to do um, because we, we don't have time. We get bored too easily, right? So you, you never get stuck with the wrong configuration. You, you say, you know, I need 500 machines with uh, 15, 16 gig of RAM. Oh, it doesn't really fit. Damn. Well, you know, I'll take you know, this twice the number of CPUs. Let's take 250 machines with 32 gig of RAM. Oh, no problem. There we go. Um, just redeploy. We don't have to ask permission. If you're pushing something into test, if you're allocating uh, systems in test, every developer can just create as many machines as they want in test. There's no permissions, there's no approval process, there's nothing. If you're going to production, there's one approval from a manager to say, yes, I know that this thing is going into production. Right? That's the only check we have. Um, and really, all you have to do is enter a, it's a change ticket number is really all it asks you for. And you could type anything in that. So if you do that too often and break things, we'll perhaps take a fairly dim view of you. But um, so we treat everyone like an adult. And we, we assume that the developers are, know what they're doing. And that it turns out to give good responsibility. People think about it. And that giving people responsibility um, helps everything. We never run out of space and power. We were able to launch in Europe by just deploying 1,000 machines in Ireland and Amazon um, with a few weeks' notice. Well, it really didn't give anyone notice. It just took us a few weeks to get all the code lined up and get everyone to push code. We didn't have to go hire anybody in Ireland and plan stuff and do all those kinds of things. And, and you know, we don't really have an IT department anymore. We, I don't have to have meetings with them to say, please, can I have some machines? And they say it'll take months like it used to. Um, so there's a whole bunch of sort of I like what I call developer trends or, or management buzzwords, if you like. There's, there's, you know, how many people are doing big, big, big data Hadoop in production right now? A few of you? OK. How about Amazon Cloud in production? A few of you. Uh, APM, Application Performance Management, anyone doing that? It's, it's big new sort of you know, things like AppDynamics, Dynat um, Dynatrace, stuff like that. Integrated DevOps, people doing all that? 
you know, getting the dev and their ops together. Okay. Uh, continuous integration delivery. Okay, that was most of the tracks, people learning how to do it. NoSQL. Got a few people doing NoSQL. Um, so going. There we go. Platform as a service, fine grained service oriented architecture. Like nobody oh got, I got one person doing fine grain SOA. <laughs> The rest of you are going, I have a big application. It's just one big thing. All right. Social coding, open development on GitHub. Do you pull code from GitHub? Your, your application code that you developed and put on GitHub, is that the source of your build that you put in production? A few of you? All right. So we, we've been doing all this stuff. You know, first time we did this. This is the first year we did this in production. So we've done all of these things. Uh, and that's usually why I think, you know, why I'm up here talking to you rather than the other way around, because we've figured out how to do all this stuff over the last few years. And um, there's a whole separate presentation about why Netflix gets so far ahead of most of what's going on in the industry, which is to do with sort of corporate culture and brave management and um, scared engineers being dragged forwards by people that with crazy ideas in management. Anyway, so I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, as I explained, this. We built everything on top of Amazon. So we're, we're, we're doing Amazon-specific things that depend upon the features of Amazon. And so some people go, well, and you're locked into Amazon. And there's really two views of this. There's the operations focus. I mean, how many people here consider themselves op operations people? So we've got a few. OK. And then most of you probably developer people, right? Yeah. Um, Operations are always worrying about vendor lock-in, data center use cases, and cost savings because it's simple to measure cost, and, the, and you know you tend to be very cost focused. Um, developers are more focused on getting stuff done quickly, um, and if you have one mature supplier, there's less complex test and debug. You have to test everything twice if you've got two suppliers, because um, you know even if the code and the interfaces are the same, you know it's not going to work quite right in, on the other supplier. It means you get a faster time to market for your products, and your, your cost savings come in developer time, and I don't need as many developers to get something done. Right? Now, Netflix sees developer time as the biggest constraint on our business, not operations cost. Now, it may not be true if you're building widgets and you're trying to churn stuff out, cheaper widgets than somebody else, but if you're in a rapidly growing um, sort of technology innovation business, it's how fast can you, how, how many good developers can you find and how much can they produce becomes how you get ahead in the market. So we're focusing on making those developers as productive as they possibly can and giving them the best possible platform with the most functionality, which is why we built on top of, on top of Amazon. So what we have as an infrastructure base is every feature of AWS, including all the ones that we've beaten them up to develop. So they, you know, if they don't, if they have missing features. We keep pointing out the missing features, and Amazon listens. And maybe six months or a year later, this feature pops out. And we, meanwhile, we've built something that kind of does that. So we retire the thing that we built and use the Amazon one. There are a few cases of that. Um, and they're just things like, you know, there are Amazon clones, but they don't have all of the features. Like, you know, there's S3, but it only has five gigabyte files, but we want to put terabyte files in there. Uh, and, and when you write a terabyte file, you can't just do a put because it craps out after, you know, 10 gigabytes, and then you have to start again from the beginning. So multi-part writes basically means you parallelize your multi-thread in chunks and you write all your chunks, and if a chunk fails, you only repeat that chunk. So if you're doing, you know, th and that's a lot more complicated than the simple S3 stuff. So you get all these deep features. And then on top of that, we added our own features, um, large scale. It's again, it's mature, flexible, and customizable. We have a console called Asgard, which replaces the Amazon console. I'll show you a picture of it later, but that's up on GitHub. We have these, uh, somebody asked earlier, you know, what's a, what's a, uh, what's a chaos monkey? I'll explain that a bit later. But think of, like you have demons in a Unix, in, on a Linux that run stuff for the operating system. The monkeys are the uh, autonomous services that we run in our cloud, and we have chaos monkeys and janitor monkeys and things like that that tidy stuff up and kill things. Um, and then we spent a lot of time working on Cassandra and Zookeeper automation to make it trivial for anybody to deploy a Cassandra cluster. Um, so at the end of that, if you're a developer, I've got an analogy here. Um, if you're a rock band and you're about to go on tour and you're trying to decide who writes the set list, is it the roadie or the musician? Right? Let's say you're Eddie Van Halen and you want to take 
you want you do the set list, but this set list requires an awful lot of different guitars to play it. Whereas the roadie would like you just take one guitar, right? <laughs> right? So that's the ops guy. I want to keep it simple, one guitar, it's easy. I can get like three copies of them and they'd be identical and everything will just work and it make my life easier. But Van Hay Eddie wants to play all of the songs over his whole history and he needs all these cool looking guitars, including the weirdly shaped one over there. Um, so really, you do need all those guitars on tour. And if you're a developer, you want to choose the highest functionality platform that will let you build the richest product in the fastest time. Now, the problem with that, we call freedom and responsibility at Netflix. Developers are leveraging the cloud to get their freedom. We have no silos. It's a single organization. There's no separate IT ops organization that constrains what the developers can do. There's no separate product organization. We're one integrated product unit that includes all development and operations needed. And at the bottom, it just calls Amazon APIs directly. Um, but now developers are responsible for those things that the ops guys used to look after for you. So you've got compliance, performance, and availability, and all these things. You just have to deal with it. And, and it turns out that you can train developers to be responsible for compliance, performance, and availability. And there's this nice Eddie Van Halen quote that he went to rehab, and he, he was able to change and get better at the, doing these things. There's a version of this slide deck that has Van Halen references on every single slide because I, I did a conference where the, the guy who ran the conference was a heavy metal freak. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to talk briefly about what is this service because most of you probably haven't seen it, but it is coming soon. Um, we announced a few months ago that we're launching in the Nordic countries. Um, so we're now into October, so you know, maybe later this month, maybe coming soon, a few more weeks, um, you'll see the Netflix streaming service. Now, if you go to netflix.com right now in Denmark, um, you get this nice screen here saying, please give us your email address and we'll let you know when it's coming. But one of the cool little things, and you can't really see this down the bottom, at the bottom of the page, there's something that says um, EU West 1, and then there's a funny hexadecimal looking thing, and then it says DK. So that funny hexadecimal thing, if you've ever used Amazon, is an instance ID. <laughs> so, that, that, so that basically we render in the bottom of the page which, um, which machines had sent it to you. So that is an a Amazon Ireland US, EU West 1 um, machine. Uh, it's kind of a little thing. I'm, sometimes these things maybe don't come up. I have sort of various debug stuff turned on, but it's kind of fun. Um, so that's, that's what it looks like if you're not a member. When you are a member, you get something that looks more like this. It gives you a whole lot of movies. We have Facebook integration, so I can see stuff that my friends watch. Um, and uh, you know, all the things that I've been watching recently, and there's a whole lot of bits and pieces there. So basically, that's the member website. It's basically giving you hundreds of movies to choose from um, and trying to pick the ones that will be best for you rather than just giving you the sort of alphabetical list of every movie we have. Now, that's delivered via another service we have, which is a CDN. Now, we have our own built-in Netflix CDN. We previously, we used Akamai Limelight at level three, but we've recently augmented that with our own CDN, and that's what we're primarily using as we're rolling out new services. Um, so Netflix is a hardware company. This is the box that we have. It's 100 terabytes of movies in a box. Uh, we give it to you for free if you happen to be an ISP with several gigabits of Netflix traffic coming through. Uh, and that saves you money and saves us money. Uh, it runs BSD, and we've put, we did all of the uh, IPv6 work uh, on this box, and we put the fixes back into BSD. We found some bugs in uh, the IPv6 support. About half the world's IPv6 traffic runs from these boxes. The other half is YouTube. And then there's noise on the axis, which is Yahoo and Facebook and everybody else that does IPv6. But you know, about 90, you know, 49% of the world's IPv6 is Netflix. The other four, another 49% is is YouTube. That was sort of World IPv6 Day last last summer. Um, and we've open sourced not only the software for this box, but the hardware design of the box too. So this is kind of going open hardware instead of open source. Um, here's an old picture from a few years ago. We now have 800 different streaming devices that we can operate to, digital TVs and things. And we've been shipping these digital TVs into Europe for a while. Um, and what happens is when you turn on the service is that their software internally says, oh, look, I do Netflix now. Netflix icon will appear. Uh, on, so we have sleeper code in lots of, uh, lots of uh, consumer electronics devices going global. So the major services we have, we have a non-member site, a member site, 
CDNs, all the back end for controlling and managing and routing traffic to that CDNs is all running on the cloud. Uh, we have APIs for internal external devices and APIs for controlling video playback, uh, DRM, QoS, and all that. So all of these services run as fine-grained SOA on Amazon. So this is you know, one view of our service. Each little box here is a different tier. It's, a, it's not a machine, it's a group of machines. So this shows the traffic between the different services. This is actually just running in our test account uh, at one point because the production one is even harder to draw and it's got too much stuff on it. So some of those boxes might have 500 servers in, some might be just five or six, something like that. If you actually pick one service, let's say our web front end, it looks something like this. Again, this is out of our test account. Um, so you see it says start, this is a view from App Dynamics, which is basically doing Java bytecode instrumentation and measuring the flows through all of our code. Um, so you see an end user calls the, uh, the web service and it's talking to a whole bunch of other bits and pieces. Um, there's a uh, sim service which finds movies that are similar to other movies and a bunch of other things like that. Uh, now, that's the, the overall flow, but what you really care about is a single request. So another thing App Dynamics does is it, it captures single requests, and if it sees something slow, it'll just grab it. So what I can do here is I can click in on any of these little boxes, those little black boxes, the drill in, and it gives me the stack trace of the code and, where, and which, what, exactly what HTTP or SQL request or whatever it made, or memcached or whatever. So you basically you get all the code and you can see what's going on. So this is how we drill in and figure out what, what's going on. To get some idea, it's a very fine-grained architecture. Each of these services does one thing. So the similar service, you give it a user ID and a movie ID, and it returns all the movies which are similar to that movie, but filtered for that customer, right? So if it, you know, you might find a movie like Scooby-Doo, right, which adults and kids both like. If I do a Scooby-Doo thing, it would get like adult stuff that's like that. But if it was a kid that did it, it would get the kid stuff, right? So different things like that. So we have a bunch of architectural patterns. I'll talk a bit about the availability model here. So we have lots of little isolated services that do one thing. They're stateless, and they're replicated horizontally. That, uh, but to deal with that, the developer model is resilient business logic. So let's say I'm the, I'm the web service, and I'm going to call this similar service and say, hey, give me the movies that are similar to this. What happens if I don't get an answer back? Well, I have to write code that assumes that I may never get an answer back from any other service that I call, and I have to do something sensible. And in this case, you just, you know, the, the movie, the home page is lots of different rows. One of the rows is a similars row. If the similar service is down, you don't get those rows. You get like normal genres or you get some other kind of rows. We just, uh, we just drop out things so that it gradually falls back to a less and less personalized experience, but it's a gradual degradation. You can't really see it happening unless you know exactly what it's supposed to look like. We also put everything in three balanced availability zones, and I'll draw some pictures of that a bit later. And then we triple replicate all of our persistence, and I'll, show, I'll explain more about that. So I'm giving a talk later tomorrow afternoon in the NoSQL track about uh, highly available NoSQL with Cassandra, and I've got a whole load of slides, a lot more slides there about uh, Cassandra and how we use that. And then we also build our isolated regions, so uh, US and Europe are separate and don't take each other down. So if we go back to that diagram that we had before, um, we test this with the chaos monkey, which kills individual services. So I say I kill that service. Everything else just keeps working. Uh, we have a latency monkey, which adds latency or makes that service return errors at some rate. So I can make it return 500 series error codes or make up an error code and see what happens. Um, and the services that called it just have to deal with that. Or you can insert three-second delays or, or make it never res respond occasionally. And what happens then is you get the errors and the latency ripple out from that point, and the other services have to absorb it. We test that in production. We test the Chaos Monkey killing individual instances in production. So like I said, we have three balanced availability zones. So there's a load balancer at the top. It's feeding all the traffic into zone A, B, and C, which are separate buildings, which are around a millisecond apart, right? So they're separate data centers within Amazon's environment. Um, there are, US East has five zones, Europe has three zones. So you pick three of those. And we're the, all the communication between zones 
uh, if this is set up completely correctly according to the architecture, which of course it isn't quite, but it's near enough for most cases, uh, you do all the replication side to side at the Cassandra and caching layers. So the persistence layers, the, the stateful services talk sideways to make sure that that state exists in all three zones, or the stateless services just talk amongst themselves. So that if we lose an entire zone when there's a power outage, which has happened occasionally, the, the load balancers have two, you know, two thirds of the capacity still there, and everything should still work. I've got two copies of the data. Uh, when the data comes back, I can you know, copy the data back, get everything back in sync, and keep running again. But, or I can basically just turn off the traffic so I'm no longer sending traffic to that zone, uh, and then you know, it'll be clean. I should then have no errors. Now, if this works right, we get a slightly higher error rate for about two or three minutes after losing a, like a power outage on a third of our capacity. Right? When it goes wrong, it takes out the whole thing, but that's bugs. <laughs> the way it's supposed to work is that it's supposed to keep working, and it has done that a bunch of times. Now, if, if we look at the persistence layer, um, when we're doing maintenance on Cassandra, like updating a Cassandra cluster, we, we have a continuous operation which is updating nodes with the newer version of Cassandra or doing maintenance on them. And so it takes a Cassandra node out of service. Now that's three copies of the data. So what that means is that I'm effectively losing one copy of the data that is in that local zone. I still have two other copies. So what, I, what happens then is while it's under maintenance, um, we stop replicating traffic to it and any machine that's in that tries to talk to that particular persistent store goes and gets the data from the other zones. Okay. So it's th but this is happening all the time. We don't need to test this because we're walking around our... We get the new version of Cassandra every two months, so we got very good at upgrading it automatically. We have Jenkins jobs that do nothing but upgrade Cassandra. So we have about 600 Cassandra instances and about 60 distinct clusters. And I don't know why we have 60 clusters, except that we made it trivially easy for developers to deploy clusters. And if you make something trivially easily, you get a lot of it, right? So... <laughs> I. Yeah, with a few clicks on a website, I, you know, not really that much of a developer nowadays, I can deploy an arbitrary large Cassandra cluster. Just go, please make one, and it comes up, and it appears about five minutes later. So then we have US and Europe, and they, it's a clone, right? We have three things. So you see my little diagram? I, I have now have six complete copies of all my data. I have six copies, of, six batches of every service, but I have traffic from Europe going into the right, and traffic from the US going to the left something like a 10 to 1 ratio right now, although the European site is growing you know, proportionately faster than the US site, so that's gradually, that ratio is decreasing. Um, and then we have global replication between the two. And this is done across the public internet with you know, SSL protected, you know, TLS basically between them. So it's encrypted and the back ends, but the Cassandra has a way of finding the nodes in the other, cl in the other cloud, and we have security groups set up and stuff like that. So basically, what that means is that anything I write into Europe within a second or so will actually be in the US. It's sort of you know, 100 milliseconds, 150 milliseconds latency. So it's just whatever, however many round trips it took to send the data. Uh, what that means is that if you sign up as a member of Netflix in Europe, and you, when, when that happens, we write the data in Europe, but it spreads to everywhere in the world. So if you then visit America, on vacation or for a business trip, you should just use Netflix. You're already a member of Netflix. You're a global member. So it's a global membership model. It's like sort of eBay or something. I mean, there are mem members everywhere in the world, and you just sign up once, and you're done. Um, OK. So if the network between the US and Europe goes down temporarily or gets slow or whatever, um, everything just keeps working. Both sides work independently. This is, if you think cap theorem, this is AP, right? Partition, and I'm available. Both sides are available. I can write into both sides. I can continue to sign up members, and later on it goes away, and Cassandra's anti-entropy mechanisms kick in and everything gets back in sync again. And when we lost the entire zone, uh, we didn't have to, t Europe didn't go down, we lost the zone in the US, and, uh, it, and we didn't have to deal with it. When the US came back, it just cleaned itself back up. And we have some manually sequenced jobs, but it's mostly Jenkins jobs, that there's Jenkins processes that run around sequencing when we do repairs. Now, if we lose an entire you know, region, the other region still works. So that's the way we currently work. So let's look at that in terms of failure modes and effects. Um, we've got the failure mode probability of it, which I rate as high if it happens every week, 
um, because we deploy new code very aggressively um, and uh, we just deal with it. Um, it's low if we you know, basically hardly ever see it and, or have never seen it, and it's medium if it happens on often enough that we want to be able to have a mitigation strategy for it. So if the application fails, that's the uh, circuit breaker pattern or dependency command, as we call it. Um, basically, your software just has to be able to deal with the fact that everyone you're calling might, might be dead. And it may be because they just pushed some code, and that code's broken, and they didn't realize, and they'll, they'll be broken for a couple of minutes before they realize, and then they'll switch it back. So that's kind of, we, we have very rapid rollback set up. Um, and it's uh, as soon as you tell. So we, we, the way we push code is we, we, let's say we have 500 API servers and we have a new build. We'll, we'll create 500 new API servers with the new code. Well, actually, the first thing we'll do is we'll create a, a sample of a canary server, we call it, of the new code. That, and then uh, if the canary survives, we'll make more of them. Um, and then we'll point all the traffic at the new ones, but we leave the old ones there at least through that night's peak traffic, so about eight hours, 12 hours. They automatically disappear 12 hours later. That's when the janitor monkey cleans them up or something like that. Um, various mechanisms for doing that. But the idea is that the old code is still sitting there and the machines are warmed up and ready. They're just not taking any traffic. And uh, if anything goes wrong with the new ones, you can flip the load balancer back to it immediately. Um, let me see, region failure. It's, it's happened occasionally, and it's typically there was a routing error which took out the entire region because it black hole routed all of US East for about half an hour. Um, every outbound packet could not leave. You could send traffic to it, but you never got anything back. So that is a total region outage. Um, but as soon as they fixed the routing, everything came back, and no, no machines were harmed in this. It was just no traffic. That's really the only region-level outage that we've seen. Most of the other outages that people have called like, oh, the entire Amazon region went down was actually a zone going down that caused a bunch of websites that were based in that zone to go down. Um, and uh, the last outage we had was because we had a bug and we didn't correctly handle the case of, of losing uh, one zone. Um, so zone failure, we say medium, uh, we, we intend to be able to run out of two or three zones. We have a Chaos Gorilla, which is the bigger version of the Chaos Monkey, which is designed to kill an entire zone and see if everything runs. And we, we, last time there was a major Amazon outage was just before we were about to test that case and we didn't find the bug in time, so it's kind of annoying. But um, yeah, the Chaos Gorilla is an interesting, interesting thing to test. <laughs> Uh, it, it's also capable of moving our, all of our infrastructure to a different zone. So Amazon has five zones, so we're running in three of them. If one of the ones we're using breaks, the Chaos Gorilla has a mode where it moves if all of our infrastructure from that zone into a different zone, and you have to reprogram all of the load balancers and everything. Um, let me see, data center failure happens reasonably often. We've basically been moving everything to the cloud because our data center turns out is less reliable and the machines we have in there, things like Oracle goes down or corrupts data and you have to wait for it to come back and that's kind of annoying. Um, data store failure, we haven't really lost anything out of Cassandra but we do continuous backups. I'll talk more about that tomorrow. Um, we, we can restore from S3. It's a single REST call will cause a Cassandra a cluster to restore itself to a point in time. Very, very tidy. And then if S3 fails, which again, is, uh, we've never seen, uh, we have a remote copy of all that data, which, and we have another copy that isn't even on Amazon at all. So we just have our backup files and we keep them um, on the other side of the country and everything. So the actual deployment and uh, the, the rollout we took the first thing we started processing on Amazon was the, the videos themselves. So we're getting all these videos in, and as we got more and more videos, we have to re-encode them into like the Xbox format and the Apple TV format and the, the, the consumer TV formats. And, the, and we, they all wanted slightly different formats. So we had to reprocess all of our videos, and we, we, we don't do any dynamic. Um, we're not re-encoding re them on the fly. We're, doing very high quality in code. So we're putting a lot of effort, a lot of CPU time into getting the best possible picture at the lowest possible bandwidth, right? That it's worth spending longer because we have enough customers that we know we're going to be showing that video stream lots of times. If you do on the fly encoding, which is sometimes used particularly for mobile because it's relatively low bandwidth and there are too many different types of mobile devices, you tend to get much lower quality encodes that way. 
that feeds CDNs, goes out through the ISPs, and the, the data rate we are feeding to our customers is measured in terabits. It, it's still measured in terabits at 4 a.m. <laughs> our low point in our graph is still terabits, right? We're, the high point is lots of terabits. Um, and the last number we saw was 32% of the total US uh, I, um, bandwidth to customers. Like 32% of the internet's capacity at peak evening Netflix watching time is just Netflix streaming movies to people in the US. Um, I believe in three months in the UK, we were 2% of the total UK traffic. That was after three months of launch. And after about, about nine months in the UK, we have a million customers. So I'm not sure how many. So we're probably several percent now. Um, YouTube's about 10% of US bandwidth. Hulu's about 2% or 2 or 3%. Uh, and BitTorrent's about 10%. So we're like several times bigger than BitTorrent. OK. So we did that. Once we had everything running at volume, we had too many logs, so that didn't fit in the data center. We moved log processing to the cloud. That's when we started using Hadoop, and that was in 2009. Um, then we put the APIs that handle the playback and DRM in the cloud because we were getting too much of that traffic. Um, and then in 2010, we had this big race, and we had these slide decks with pictures of aircraft trying to take off and big explosions at the end of the runway. And it says, OK, you have to. Uh, look, we, we didn't have a backup plan. It's like, no, we are not going to build another data center. We know we don't have enough capacity to run the website by the end of this year. <laughs> right? And we are not going to build that capacity, and you have to make it work in the cloud before the end of the year. <laughs> right? So this was the, the oncoming thing, and we just got up. Right? So like just before Christmas, we got the last service out of the, out of the data center um, that we had to. Um, and that really got everybody's attention and like, focused on making it happen. Um, so that, that worked pretty well in the end. Um, it's almost all Cassandra at this point. The rating system still runs on MySQL. That's actually a very old application, and they're in the middle of re rebuilding it to run on Cassandra. That's the only customer-facing app we have running on MySQL. And if, this, if it breaks, we actually the site works without it. It's the thing that tells you how many stars each movie is, should be for you. It's a personalized star rating. Um, and we just the stars just we do without them. We just they disappear from the UI. Um, then we got the API out. And then finally, in 2011, with like, things like customer service started con transferring to the cloud. And in 2012, we've been moving billing. We're, we're relatively get, getting somewhat close to doing a PCI, D, a PCI DSS in the cloud. That's probably going to happen, start happening in the next six months to a year. Um, and we're already doing SOX compliance, which is those of you in the US know about SOX compliance. So that's already happening in the cloud. All right. So I'm going to talk a bit about some of the patterns that, that we've been using here. And to start with, um, we're going to go look at the goals. So we started off with this code in the data center. This was about three years ago. And um, we had a team of about 12 people that we took off of all the other projects. And, and I was managing most of them. And I managed this, this process. And that's how I ended up as this cloud architect kind of thing. But I was a development manager then. And this was what I wrote down three years ago. Um, says, we want to be faster. There was a different VP asking for each of these. Like One VP wanted it to be faster. I want lower latency. The guy that cares about product. Um, then um, the guy who was kept worrying about getting us into the cloud, we, we can't use any more data center capacity. We don't want to buy any more. We don't do any build out. We have to do this in the cloud. And we have to have no central vertically scaled databases. Um, we needed better availability. And uh, my manager in particular was saying, we need to optimize for agility of a large developer team um, and leave behind this eight-year-old tangled code base where it really was one big blob of code where everything was all integrated every two weeks. And we'd sort of try and debug it for another week and then chuck it over the wall and hope it worked. Um, so we went to this clean, layered, reusable component model. And I came up with this uh, list of anti-architecture things. Because one of the things I found with uh, working with developers is if you say, please build this, they will build that or something that looks like that. And they'll tack on all these interesting things around the edge that they thought of. Um, quite often, things that you didn't want. <laughs> That's why you didn't ask for them. So what you have to do, and this works quite well, is, is I say, I don't care what you build, 
but I wanted to occupy this space, and I'm going to surround you by anti-architecture. Right? Uh, I have a whole slide deck on this I did once. So these are the things I want you to not do, and if you can remember those, then and and even if you can't remember why, you can come and say, "Well, Adrian said don't do something. Don't make my instances stateful. I wonder why he said that because I want to do a stateful one because I used to do that." So then maybe they'll come and talk to you about why. And after a while, this gets you know everyone gets it in their heads and it becomes sort of culturally just part of the pattern. But when we're trying to establish this pattern, uh, that was quite controversial that we were going to do stateless instances and we weren't going to do cookie-based routing. Um, it was sort of controversial that we weren't going that we were going to do NoSQL and uh, putting um, session data in memcache and things like that. Um, so it was th this was something that took a while, uh, and that works out to be quite a useful approach. I want to talk about instrumented code. I mean, most people write things in their code, even if it's just printf everywhere or you know whatever the equivalent, whatever language you're doing, you're printing out stuff. But we had all this code that everyone was instrumenting, but they were instrumenting it, their own code, as they wrote it. What we did for the cloud was we moved from having the unit of integration being a jar file, where everyone built their own jar file, and then the QA people tried to integrate them all, to everyone builds a service, a REST service. So you had to design your own REST interface, but everyone was using the same base servlet. And we instrumented that base servlet with an annotatable object, and you just annotated your thing, and it was the same object spitting out of this thing through like log4j streams off into the into our back end. It all turns up in Hive or wherever or wherever you want to analyze it with the same names on the same columns, and you know you end up with a very stable, predefined way of of producing things, and that means that you, even if you write add no instrumentation at all to your system, it's already instrumented because all of the the libraries and the the things you're, all, the, all of the building blocks you're using are all pre-instrumented. And that, that makes it, the instrumentation patterns make it much easier to build tooling that can then use those patterns to give you nice visualizations of what's going on. And if somebody ignores the standard patterns, then they get annoyed that they don't have tooling, then eventually that kind of, it sticks and carrots, right? This is the carrot approach to getting people to follow patterns. You build tooling for the pattern, and then people use the pattern because they want to use the tooling. OK, so let's talk about this chaos monkey. We did a tech blog post because we've open sourced this recently. Um, computers die. Data center computers die. W w you know, if you're running low cost commodity stuff, it dies more often. But even the expensive stuff dies. So the problem is that most developers like to think of the machine they're coding to as being a perfect machine that works, because that's your normal experience. And it's annoying when they die. So you don't want to just keep unplugging your laptop or pulling the battery out in the middle of coding just to see what happens, right? Um, but in order to test the error handling code that you've built, you have to inject failure. And what we're doing here with the Chaos Monkey is in a distributed fine grain SOA, killing individual instances is is a way of injecting that kind of failure mode. So between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. every weekday, we randomly pick a machine in production and we kill it. Um, of you know, it just randomly picks stuff, and, and then in test it does the same thing, but at a higher rate because there are fewer machines. And you, know, and you can opt out if you're in the middle of debugging something and something's in a certain state. Sometimes you forget, which is annoying, but but you, you opt that one out so it doesn't get killed underneath you. And we made this a default on, and it was one of the first services we set up. So as people started to develop in the cloud, there was always a chaos monkey there. Right? You can't put it in as the last thing you do before you go live, because it will discover all of the bad things that you've been sneaking in there. And there's a nice little um, chaos monkey logo uh, that somebody at Amazon made some nice t-shirts with chaos monkeys on, too. I may, may wear that tomorrow. Um, all right. so. This sort of chaos monkey idea spawned a whole lot of what we call the simian army of monkeys. So we have many of them now, and we're open sourcing more of them soon. OK, so if we make developers responsible for failures then, and wake them up at 3 AM when they write broken code that breaks at 3 AM, then they learn to write code that doesn't break. Um, and you know, it's possible. I mean, if you don't learn, to, then you probably just leave other, or get pushed to leave. Um, but generally speaking, we, you end up with a team of developers who, who can go really fast because they're not having to deal with other people getting in their way, but they're responsible for what they're doing. 
We use incident reduce to find gaps to fix, make sure there's no blame in the room, nobody gets upset in an incident review. It's all about, okay, what do we, wh how can we fix, what con you, it's either you give somebody the wrong context or the information wasn't there, there's, there's, there's always a good reason. If somebody's incompetent two or three times in a row, it's better, you know, we'll find a way to get rid of them, right? But that doesn't happen that often. Um, so a couple of things that you figure out. One is that um, there's a natural tendency when, when you notice things timing out is to extend your timeout. But it's actually better to shorten your timeout because it's much better to turn a timeout into an error. The sooner you turn the, the, uh, something that's slow into an exception, um, the system just behaves better with propagating errors through it than propagating latency because what happens when something gets too much latency in it is you start tying up all your threads and everything gums up and you start affecting the ability for other services that would otherwise have succeeded to get into your system. So be very careful about that. And the other thing is to make all your configuration options dynamic. You don't want to have to push code to tweak the timeout on a service or turn off a feature or something like that. And we have we built a, and we've open sourced a, a hierarchical dynamic configuration system called Archaeus. And what this gives us is the ability to apply override configuration at any level of granularity. I can do a global override to everywhere that we have this service deployed. I can do it to one instance in one zone, or I can do it all the instances in zone A, or I can do it to all the instances in Europe. So it's got a hierarchy and a series of overrides and defaults. And we do a, it's actually the back end we have for that is actually a, a Cassandra cluster which runs in all of these different zones. So you change this property and it propagates through Cassandra and then every, every region uses it. Um, if, you were, if you've been following uh, Michael Nygaard's Release, Release It book, that's a fairly popular book in this audience, there's a circuit breaker pattern in there. Again, we did a, we have a, I, I mentioned this book to some of our developers and they read it and went off and implemented circuit breakers and we're, we're the guy was supposed to open source this but he keeps getting busy. So we're, we're going to be open sourcing our implementation, this you know, Java circuit breaker thing, which basically kicks off a, a thread runs a future, calls the, you know, wraps up the dependency library in this, in this future thread, and uh, if, it, if it fails, there's a fallback methods, and it's got all of the other stuff. And then it's got a monitoring thing that gives you one second granularity updates of the state of each circuit breaker, so you can see in real time which circuit breakers are failing. This was the API front end team team's approach to not getting woken up at 3 a.m. because one of their dependencies had broken, and of course the errors always turn up at the front. So they built this as a defense mechanism to, to point the finger at, no, it's these guys that are broken, you can leave them sleeping nicely, whereas these guys that built a bad library or a bad service get the call because the guys who figure out who to phone have this tool that points the finger very accurately at who actually is causing the problem right now. And I won't walk through this whole thing. It's, it's a very, it, the guy that did this, uh, Ben Christensen, is a you know, really cool developer and he was at there's a video, I think, of him. He was at QCon Brazil, QCon Sao Paulo. So there's probably a video of him giving this talk if you, if, uh, up online by now. So we're going to build our own platform out of all these components. And um, you know, I got a nice Van Halen picture. He's got his guitar collection. They all look slightly similar, but they've all got the same picture. So it's a pattern, right? Pattern-based approach to building your own guitars. Um, the components you need. So we've got to build code. We have a continuous build system, Jenkins-based, that turns code into AMIs. Our unit of provisioning is an AMI. We're not using Puppet or Chef. We use Yum once, <laughs> and that makes our AMI. And then we tell Amazon, to please make 500 of them. And everything's pre-installed. There's no Yum. Yum can't fail because I've already done it, right? Um, Amazon accounts, we split our accounts to, by test production across those things. So we have the same account running in Europe, Europe and the US and wherever, right? We have a production account that's global, but then we have a test account that's global, right? So that's how it works. You could slice the other way, but that seems to work best for us. We have a gateway, I'll show you what that means for getting into the cloud if you want to log in, that gives us some, some auditing and controls there. We have a service registry, configuration properties service, a bunch of persistent services, you could have monitoring, alert forwarding, backups and archives. And that's the basic platform pieces. With all those pieces, then you can just start deploying code and building your own service on top. So there's a, a talk by um, Brian Moyles and Gareth Bowles on SlideShare, um, which is at, from a Jenkins conference or something. 
This is what our build pipeline looks like. Um, we've got, we build from Perforce. We've been using Perforce for many years. Now we've started using GitHub because it's out there, and we have an internal Git repository as well. So the system basically goes and pulls the data out of GitHub, puts it in the front end of the build pipeline, chunks it through. So if you want to deploy new code to production for one of our open source projects, most cases, it's not always true, but most cases you put the code into, you, know, you test it locally, but the production version, you actually put it into the open source repository, and then it flows back down through when we use it. Um, OK, so you know, the standard se steps within Jenkins, sync, resolve, check, compile, build. And then we publish the components, which are jar files or whatever, in Artifactory. And then Yum pulls those out and basically has builds RPMs. And you know, we, we stick it into our, our um, currently CentOS, but we're also moving to using Ubuntu soon. So the architecture that this runs on is that there's a master in our data center, because we had to start somewhere and we didn't have cloud. You know, you've got to bootstrap yourself. Um, and that runs a bunch of slaves that are also in our data center. But we kept running out of capacity. And these guys said, we're cloud people. We can figure this out. So they use Amazon VPC to create dynamic build slaves in the cloud that are an extension of our data center-based build system. Right. So whenever we do a complete rebuild and we need you know, 1,500 jobs up here, it'll just spin up an arbitrary number of cloud-based machines. And if one gets idle for half an hour, it just quits and goes away. And that kills itself, right? So that's basically the model. Uh, the software for doing that, we call it DynaSlave. And that's on our list of things we're going to open source fairly soon, later this year, later, later this quarter now. So there's a bunch of things we're doing. We, we've been using Ivy for our dependency mapping. We sort of poke at Maven a little bit. Uh, and then we've ended up sort of migrating everything to Gradle, which is sort of the best of both. Um, and that's, that's our current approach. Um, and we use a lot of Groovy, Grails kind of stuff in-house anyway. So we've just ended up using Groovy as a you know, sort of Java shop. You end up using Groovy as your kind of fallback language for a bunch of things. Um, so this, again, will be part of the uh, open sourcing, I think. So the bakery basically creates these base AMI. So well, the first step in the bakery is that about once a month, we create a new base AMI that contains all the latest patches and stuff that we care about and built-in monitoring tools and stuff. And then everything that you then build is installed on top of that base AMI. So uh, like it's got Tomcat and Apache and all that stuff. So on top of that, the build process takes the base AMI and just drops in, you know, drops in your WAR file or whatever else you wanted, uh, mounts it, mounts an EBS snapshot, installs and bakes it. And it bakes into tests. So all of our build system produces code that goes AMIs that go to test. Once you've figured out that that's working code and you like it, there is a rebake operation that, mo that, that applies script level that modifications and changes some environment variables and takes that AMI and makes a production version of that AMI. And then you ought to scale that into production. Right? So the build system never, gener never goes directly to prod, it, or prod. It always goes through test. And there's a bakery in each region because AMIs are, and the S3 stuff is regional. OK. So the accounts we set up, we're isolating concerns with each account. So we've got a test account for development and test. We have a tagging operate mechanism so that an individual developer can say, well, I want this, these two or three services to be my special version that I'm working on. But the rest of these 300 different services, I'll just use the generic ones. Right? So that, that gives us a way to flow your, co your, your traffic through a, a, a purpose-built stack, because we've got a few hundred developers sharing this environment. Um, and then in production, well, it's order scale groups only. There are no isolated instances. In fact, the monkeys in prod, if they see an isolated instance that is not part of an order scale group, they will terminate it. <laughs> that teaches you not to do that fairly quickly. They, will, you know, they don't wait or argue. They just say, no, they're, the architecturally, everything must be in an order scale group. And if, if you're not, you shouldn't be here. Um, so that's implementing policy in code. You, don't to get, oh, you can shout at the monkey, but he doesn't care. <laughs> um, let me see. What else have we got? We have an audit, a separate account for audit. So you want to, if you're going to be audited for SOX or PCI, you want to keep that 
that concern as small as possible. So we've got like 10,000 machines in our regular account. And this one's got maybe 100, less than 100 machines. And there's a few developers that have the special LDAP group and the special privileges, and, and they can get into those machines. Uh, and then we've had the people that have been had like a positive background check that can actually get into the vault where they keep the credit cards and all that kind of stuff. So you know, you've got to have more and more access controls and more auditing to get access into these systems. But you know, 99% of our code and developers don't need to touch that, and they don't deploy to that system, so we can leave it very open and free to, for them to work, uh, what, do whatever they want. And then we have a separate account for disaster recovery and archives that is a read-write but no delete, and it uses S3 in the overwrite mode, so you can't delete something by overwriting it. It just stacks the versions, right? And then it times everything out after a few months. And that's where we keep our archives on the other, you know, we put them in a different, we archive into a different region. And it's a different account with different credentials, so you can't sort of crack the account and then get into this one. And we encrypt the data we put there too, just because we're paranoid, I guess. Um, reservations, there's some interesting things that people are still trying to figure out with Amazon. But you can combine all your accounts into one bill, and you can pull capacity to get bigger volume discounts. And reservations, there's a couple of cool things you can do, but just by using reservations, you get a 71% discount. Once you get a few million dollars worth of volume, there's additional discounts on top of that. So if you're putting a, a substantial amount of traffic into Amazon, it's like any enterprise vendor at this point. You're into increasingly large discounts. So don't look at the list published list price and assume that that's the, the, the price at volume. You, you, can, get, you can get it down. Um, you also get priority with reservations. So if I've got an unused reservation, I say, please give me that machine, you're guaranteed to get that machine provisioned to you. If you're doing the on-demand thing and they happen to be out of stock, then you can say, you can get back a little error. Sorry, we don't have any of them left kind of thing. But if you reserved it, you get it. Um, and then this very cool thing, which may, if you don't get this and you, and, you're, and you care about it, talk to me later. Unused reservations are shared among accounts. So we have unused reservations in production because we're, that's where we want our extra capacity to be and we want to always guarantee them. But we have all these machines in test that is just fluctuating capacity. And when, at the end of the month, the, the unused reservations in production are applied to the machines we have in test. So we actually end up using, you know, getting a big discount on our test machines. Right? But I'm getting the benefit of the reservations in production. It, it's a neat trick and, and anyway. That's, don't worry about it if you didn't get what I was talking about. Um, so we have a bunch of developers, and they all want to get in. Uh, everyone's been to King's Cross in London, you, and the, anyone's into um, all the Harry, Harry Potter stuff. That's actually, they have this sign up on the thing. It can stay sh between st uh, platform nine and platform 10. There is actually a, a wall with platform nine and a half or three quarters or whatever it's written on it. So it seems like a good gateway thing. Um, so we have all these different, pro you know, let's say I have my web server service, and I have a data access layer service, and then I have a Cassandra service. And all of the security groups are set up for them to be able to talk to each other. And I want to SSH in and mess with one of these, or watch it, or run VMstat, or something like that. Um, if I log into the front end, I can then, uh, the SSH, I can't get to a different service. I, I can only be in one instance. I can only get to my instances through the gateway, which means I can audit log everybody that ever logs in, everyone that ever copies data back and forth. So we have a history, and we use this in production, but for the auditable audit account, this is quite important. We can track because we can control and we can see what's going on. We don't stop you doing it, but we, we log everything. So we know who logged into which service and what they did and whether they copied anything back and forth. Right? And that's very useful if something weird happens and you find that a system's in a weird state. You can find who did it and ask them why they did it. And you know, It's not usually for like, malicious reasons. It's usually that somebody didn't realize that they were doing something that would break it. Um, but the key thing here is that the security groups on the individual machines only trust the gateway. They don't trust each other. Uh, and that's, uh, it, we always set it up that way. Everyone's used to it. And um, it's a neat way of, of, of configuring everything. So let's add some code. Um, how much time have I got? Am I out of time? Yeah. OK. Let's see. I'll go a bit quicker. Um, this is our GitHub account, which we made using some Netflix things. But these are the um, different apps we have. 
Uh, let's go through. We have the, well, we have all the different phases: so image baking, ASGs, uh, launching, registering, configuration, all the runtime stuff. This is Asgard. Uh, I got a summary thing somewhere. There we go. So this is the open source projects we have. And I can't even read it on my screen here. Can I make this bigger? Um, all right. So we have um, Priam is Cassandra as a service. I can deploy a Cassandra cluster trivially. It, it automatically configures everything. Asanax is a client library. All the ones that are in red are currently on GitHub. Um, it's an improvement. If anyone's been doing Cassandra, they may probably be using Hector, which is the standard Java client. We, there were a bunch of things that weren't working well for us, so we wrote our own. Cast JMeter is a test suite. It's a modified JMeter for, for putting stress testing. And then we have Zookeeper and, and uh, Zookeeper patterns, um, a discovery service like a service registry, um, a dynamic property service that I mentioned. We have auto-scaling scripts, which basically let you publish a business metric into Amazon so you can use it as an auto-scaling metric. Um, Log4j streaming. Asgard is this massive console, uh, big Groovy Grails app. Um, and then we have the Chaos Monkey. So those are the ones that we've got out already. We've had blog posts about EV Cache and Circuit Breaker, um, but those are going to come out as code as well pretty soon. We have an Explorers framework, which is uh, all of the consoles and dashboards you need to view everything. There's a Cassandra Explorer that lets you see all the clusters and see the schemas and rummage around and see what's going on. So it's um, anyone here use Juice, Google Juice for dependency injection? So that's governators coming out soon. That's uh, we, we've got there's a big mess of trying to figure out how you initialize everything in the right order, and we're, we're just re-engineering everything right now to be based on. Governator, which is a juiced version of juice, sort of. Um, Odin, we've, we've got Asgard and Odin. We ran out of Greek gods, so we started doing Norse gods, or one of the groups decided to. There's a workflow orchestration piece. Um, Entry points is a interesting service. It's a log of the state of the system of everything in the cloud with a full history. So I can say exactly what state was the site was everything in at this point in time. And there's a bunch of the, the monkeys tend to rummage around in that. It's all database service. Um, latency error injection, a, a, a more sophisticated middle tier load balancer. Uh, janitor monkey goes and cleans up Amazon resources that you haven't used for a while. Um, the whole bakery and by dinosaurs slaves I've mentioned. Um, so that's basically we've got what we're working on next. I mean, we've been working through this year on resiliency. Um, more automation, hardening, lower latency, open sourcing everything for everybody, um, getting more IPv6 work through everything. And we're going to be, our goal is to get as much of this out as possible by the end of November, which is where Amazon has a, a huge conference in Las Vegas called AWS reInvent. And uh, we've got, I think, more than 10 Netflix people presenting, including our CEO, who's doing a talk on the future of cloud. And we saw an internal version of that. And uh, half the, he knew more about cloud than half the engineers in the audience. So it was kind of interesting. Um, so that's, that's it, basically. So done. Sorry about going over time. OK. <laughs>